So this chip that we have also developed can detect dopamine release. Mm -hmm. Dopamine which is, you know, deficient in Parkinsonian patients. So you can imagine that the deep brain stimulation electrode has this device which can detect certain levels of dopamine in the terminal area. And as soon as it detects it, it talks back to the electrode yeah, and shuts shut down. down. Yeah. It's like you have a camera at the back of your car. Right. Even sometimes you can't see. It mm -hmm. will actually apply the brakes and shuts it off. Enough. Enough has happened. Right. But, you know, we're bringing all these technologies developed mm -hmm. piecemeal by piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Now the time has come to really put it together. So. So my name is Navid Sayed. I am a neuroscientist in the Hotchkiss Brain Institute here at the University of Calgary. I am the department head for cell biology and anatomy, and I'm also a special advisor to Vice President Research on Biomedical Engineering. All right, well, thanks a lot, Nawid, for uh, being interviewed by me. I'm really excited. Uh, uh, as I was telling you in my pre-interview, I've been a big fan of NeuroChip uh, um, since I first of it, heard of it two years ago in 2010. So, uh, first of all, can I ask you to briefly explain uh, what are the major milestones achieved uh, in this, uh, like, like now, compared to it's almost like two years ago now in 2010? Sure. So, you know, as you know, our brain is very complex and there are tens of billions of brain cells and each and every brain cell is ex even more complex. So if you were to think of a brain cells like a, a tennis ball, you can literally fill this room with these dendrites in terms of volume. The dendrites are the little projections, the spiny projections that receive information. So they are sort of antennas for the brain cells. Mm -hmm. They receive information from all over, they bring it to the cell body, and then they pass it through the axon to other parts of the brain. And the axon, you know, if you think again, the brain cells being the size of a tennis ball, you could make five kilometer long water hose which is about five inches thick so you can imagine all of this stuffed up into a little you know structure what we call brain mm -hmm. so the idea is that if you want to understand how brain functions it's really important that you acquire the ability to record from large networks of brain cells because anything that brain does from simple reflexes to complex motor patterns to learning and memory, it requires a large number of brain cells working together in a, in a very coordinated manner. Mm. So, be, but, before so, you go on, just to define it, so brain cells, by brain cell, this is the dendrites and exon, like, uh, the, how does it look like uh, when you're so, talking about a, a so brain cell? So it's really, um, it's a sphere which is the nucleus like any other cell, mm -hmm. but it will have lots of branches coming out like roots of a mm -hmm. tree. Uh, they are very, very delicate, very tiny, mm -hmm. and then the axon you could think about trunk of okay. the tree. Okay, so, so the axon is like the trunk, and the dendrites are yeah. like the ends of it. Yes, and mm -hmm. so they receive the information like a plant would receive nutrients, mm -hmm. and then it passes on to the other parts, which is the leaves and branches and fruits. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's a one way to look at it. But you know, you, brain cells. If you think about the way they communicate, so I am talking to you. So I am the presynaptic cell, so the cell that is talking. You're receiving this information, so you are the postsynaptic cell. Mm -hmm. Then the microphone that we are using is a synapse through which we are communicating with each mm -hmm. other. So I think the synapse is really what defines who we are. Okay. So when you think about brain, uh, it's extremely complex. So most people will record from two cells, or like we have two cameras. One is watching you, the other is watching me. Yeah. So you can communicate, but you know this is, will not tell us how the world works. So we need to be able to really record from large networks to be able to understand how brain does a particular function. And that is the motivation number one for brain chip or neurochip, to acquire the ability to or develop the ability whereby you could record from brain cells large networks to be able to understand how they function. The other motivation is if a brain cell dies, either due to stroke, trauma, injury, Parkinson's, or Alzheimer's disease, that brain cell is dead. It will not be replaced. So if your skin gets cut, it gets replaced. If your blood you lose, it gets reproduced. But if your brain cells die, either due to stroke, trauma, or injury, it will not be replaced. Mm. Uh, and the stem cell approach is not going to work in the brain because the stem cell end up producing neurons and they end up into tumors. 
Um, so even if you were to produce brain cells, you still have to guide them to specific areas. Unfortunately, the guidance molecules are no longer there. So mm -hmm. you cannot help these brain cells reach out to each other to be able to connect. So what we thought uh, quite some years ago uh, was that why cannot we develop electronic devices or bionic hybrids that could act as a substitute for injured nervous tissue. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, we realized that brain is complex. So, you know, give you an example. I was watching a football game between our local team and then another visiting team, and somebody calls me on my cell phone. And it occurred to me that there are 30,000 people, but someone can reach me with seven-digit numbers. Mm -hmm. And when I pick up the phone, even though everybody else has got the phone, I'm the only one talking. So engineers have figured it out how to target out of millions and millions of phones with simple digit numbers. Why can't we then do the same kind of approach for the brain, for the nervous system? And so we really embarked on the idea of developing a bionic hybrid. But at that time when we looked at literature, we found there were two kinds of you know, bionic hybrids that were being used in a clinical setting. Now, one of them was for people who had Parkinson's disease. They have really bad tremors. Mm -hmm. The surgeon goes in because this patient doesn't respond to drugs anymore. Yeah. They go in, they insert a deep brain stimulation electrode. The patient can stimulate that electrode themselves. The electrode would stimulate brain cells. They release the contents, which is dopamine, and then the tremors would stop. But you know, the electrode continues to stimulate those brain cells beyond the limit. And as a result, they get through what we call excitotoxicity. There is too much of the dopamine constantly being produced. Our brain cells are overexcited, but nobody tells the electrodes to stop it mm -hmm. it's because there is no loop going back to it. Mm -hmm. so that kind of bionic hybrid is only one way. Mm -hmm. The other so is so the patient knows enough to push, but then don't know when it's it to, to to stop, and then after a while, they get toxic. It ends up causing damage more. Mm -hmm. The other kind of uh, bionic hybrid is for um, people who have epileptic seizures. So the electrodes that is mounted around your brain can pick up the seizure, but it's nothing you can do about that. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to do was a two-way link whereby an electronic device that we implant in the brain or have brain cells sitting can talk to the brain cells and brain cells can talk back to them. So you have a really two-way link whereby a machine can talk to brain and brain can talk back to machine. And that we think is pivotal for any brain-controlled prosthetic device or brain-controlled you know, uh, electronic devices and vice versa. So the chip actually talks to the brain cell. Like, uh, I guess we, we're digging deeper. Uh, I, initially, I thought that the brain cell are mounted on the chip. But uh, did I get that so, wrong? So the brain cells also have electrical impulses. Mm. So they have two-way communication. The first is electrical impulse, which at the terminal becomes a chemical signal which releases a chemical, which then turns on another electrical impulse. So we actually work on electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. And so this electronic device, what we wanted to do was to create a capacitor mm -hmm. which can stimulate brain cells like as if this brain cell were stimulated by another brain cell. Mm -hmm. So the capacitor again creates a positive charge underneath the brain cell. The brain cell reaches a threshold that fires an impulse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when this impulse goes, travels, we want to be able to receive this information so we have a transistor sitting underneath the other brain cell. Yeah. So complete the loop whereby a chip or an electronic device can talk to brain cells and brain cells can talk back to electronic device. Right. Now, I've seen some photos and you holding the chip and a circuit board in the press release and article material. Do you have that uh, with you and maybe you can show me, uh, like give me a picture? Actually, I don't have that chip, but I could send you a, a movie mm -hmm. and that you know you could see for yourself as to how this really functions. And so, you know, um, the capacitor creates a positive charge because the brain cells communicate through charges, through electrical impulses. Um, and so it's a part electronics. 
the brain is part electronic. Yeah, it, it's part, part electrical, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's most, you know, most of it is um, electrical impulses. Without electrical impulses, you have no function. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's so much electricity, you can light up many 25 watt bulbs, you know, at any given time. Right. I've seen the earlier picture in the, the 2010 article, which uh, like the, the box and then four tubes going in and out. Um, yes. the, the newer version of the, the, the neuro chip that we are talking about, is it the circuit board your, uh, the co-lead researcher, uh, she, the, the, um, the, the, she, the doctor hold? Or yeah, so the new um, implementation? No, I think well, um, what I would like to do is give you a kind of a, a stepwise historical mm. perspective as to how we got to where we are. Sure, sure. You, so you give me the background and yeah. like so, logically how how yes. to guide to the thinking that you have. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, uh, so we were the first team in the world actually to develop that first bionic hybrid in 2004, and that study was covered in Discovery Channel, Time Magazine and all the other media because it's the first time anybody connected brain cells to computers and computers back to brain cells. Mm -hmm. And in and that case, is it like uh, like one or a bunch of uh, brain cells? Like we had an, a number of brain cells. We mm -hmm. also made the brain cells to be trained to exhibit learning and memory through the chip. Oh, that was yeah. really the major major breakthrough in this field, and nobody had done this before. What's it using snail brain cell too? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So that was published in two thousand and four. Since then, what we wanted to do, we wanted to increase the sensitivity of these electrodes so we could use it for rat cells because they're tiny. Their currents are tiny, mm -hmm. and since then, I think the technology has allowed us to be able to record from large networks of brain cells concurrently, simultaneously at the resolution of single brain cells. So that is really, you know, moving forward. And then because the brain cells excitability or activity relies on ion channels and ion channels are the one that are embedded in the membrane and they are the one that are targeted for almost all the drugs. We went after devising a device, designing a device that could record ion channel activity from these brain cells. And that was the next major discovery in 2010 that you were referring to. Now this chip allows us to patch clamp or record ionic currents from brain cells at a very, very fine resolution. So the, exact, the application for that technique would be that when a, pers a surgeon is operating on a patient who had seizures, they are operating because this patient did not respond to any medication no longer. And the only source now, the step for them is to take out the tissue that creates seizures. So they go in, they will cut the tissue surrounding which creates epileptic seizures. Now we will be ready to take that tissue and put it on our chip and then record spontaneously occurring seizures in that patient's brain. And now what we could do is we could understand how seizures are created, degenerated, what is the basis for them, and then do mid-throughput drug screening to find the best combination of drugs that will block seizures in that patient. Oh, so that's how you get the brain cell, the degenerative brain cell in, in one case. It's from patients which yeah. have enough serious of a problem where they yeah. had to go through yeah. surgery and, and those are post-surgery, like so it's, it's yes. life fresh from yes. the surgery. Yeah. Oh. So the idea is that you can do mid-throughput drug screening mm -hmm. and then you find a combination of drugs that block seizures in these patients because five years after the surgery, this patient will develop seizures again. Oh. But now you have personalized Medicare that you can give him that drug to control seizures. Mm -hmm. So this is a very innovative approach mm -hmm. to have more uh, what we call personalized Medicare for individuals as well as understand the basis for seizures in any given population or patients. So a layman question, I guess two questions here. One is you just mentioned something really cool, which is like a personalized care because we do from that uh, patient, we know hopefully I mean, in future situation when he or she got worse, get worse, uh, then similar approach would uh, be helpful to that patient. But you also, are you saying also, from this patient, we can kind of understand, hopefully, generally how seizure work, and maybe 
gain some general insight by absolutely. the drugs company? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, find out, you know, which ion channels are contributing to seizures, which cell undergoes seizures. Be because after surgery, these patients will develop seizures again. So it looks like in their makeup, the brain cells are programmed themselves to be seizure prone. Mm -hmm. So they will fall back to that position. So it's really important to find, to understand how these seizures are created and how we can block them and manage them. So this is, you know, one application mm -hmm. of the, our discovery, which the chip that we developed in 2010, 11. And, um, Sorry, one, one more question on that. So is, in that case, we know that it's chemical. Is that is that the case, or do we we know? We know it could be the ion channels. I think we will we will know the electrical uh, makeup that makes these seizures, these brain cells seizure prone. Um, but it's always is a combination because you know you could activate ion channels can activate one cell, but then for it to activate other cell that it is connected to, it has to go through the chemical process as well. So it's a combination of electrical and chemical imbalance. Oh, okay. But they dr give drugs to control both of them. Mm -hmm. They will slow down brain cell activity by cutting down the electrical activity. Many drugs are calcium channel blockers. They block the calcium, which is really gets brain cell their excitability. Mm -hmm. And the calcium is also needed for chemical release of messengers at the terminal. Mm -hmm. right. That's why those drugs are given. But sometimes, I think in most cases, they don't work very well. They also dumb down the brain to an extent that the patient is life is really, you know, completely incapacitated. Mm -hmm. So they don't right. do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we would like, hopefully, be able to make them tax payers rather than tax burden on the healthcare system. The other approach is that if we could devise a, a, a device which can detect seizure-like activity, what you could do is you could have a cochlear implant which can pick up seizure. And then it can dial your cell phone and let you know that, look, you're about to have seizures in three minutes. Sit down, settle down. And then the second application is it dials automatically 911, mm. it calls the ambulance, and it also calls the loved one. And then it, the GPS locator on your cell phone could tell the ambulance exactly where you are. Mm. So, you know, you could do these more advanced approaches in the future to be able to use it as a diagnostic tool to be able to predict and then manage these patients, if not treat them. Uh, how far away f are we from that future? Like implanting it, the chip and then the, the power source go, go outside of the head, it's right? It's like your cochlear implant. Mm, mm. You know, it just works very similar. It has a contained in the battery. It's all really a matter of, you know, funding because as you pointed out earlier, it is a science fiction and people view this as a science fiction. And it's very difficult to get funding for. But, you know, I, I always tell people there is no alternative. You can't bypass this. You know, as scientists, we end up looking for our lost keychain, our keys in a parking lot or in a parkade under the lamppost. It's not because it's there. It's because the only place we can see. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what really stops the progress in the area of innovation. And the other thing we also don't sometimes realize is the quality of life, standard of living with our wages. We can't compete with India and China because, you know, it's a lot easier to manufacture things there. So if, as a Canadians, we don't become innovation savvy nation, mm -hmm. we will be doomed. We will be extinct. You know, so I think it's a very important that Canada invest in these high risk technologies which are the future because mm -hmm. I think it's the only exploring future that would allow us to become innovation savvy people. Yeah. And I think that will be able to sustain our lifestyle and the quality of, of life. So, you know, not having this funding or having funding difficulty is the one that's the biggest deterrent. If that were removed, we could actually push this technology in a couple of years into the market. Mm. So, like, you do you, you see if the funding is there, we can a, actually try to push it for a clinical trial. Absolutely. And then, uh, yeah, and then maybe actually have the device available, did you say, in, the, like, two or three years? Yeah, absolutely. That's very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, have it really uh, lined up with, uh, you know, iPhone, um, you know, those companies will be very interested in, in working together to write an application that, I mean, it's a simple application. It doesn't, doesn't take much. Mm. But, you know, you need a partnership with the, 
the industry as well as you know funding to be able to do this but we have some very cool and clever ideas that we could push through very very rapidly fast. so let me let me step back so as the neurochip is currently the the breakthrough and why not the, the current packaging and the current um, state of the art chip that chip itself is has already got all the major breakthrough needed yes. to to go for like for example epilepsy Yes. And uh, and uh, Parkinson's too, right? Yes. You think yes. that, that kind of uh, human trial, if the money is there, and if the if there are patients, and presumably there are patients that are already so advanced that they they may be interested uh, to participate. In. Yeah. So I'll give you an example for a deep brain stimulation electrode. Mm -hmm. You know, we also developed another uh, chip that can detect chemical transmitter released. So that paper we have just submitted, so it can detect. Release of a chemical in the in the environment to to take a little sample and tell you whether there is oil here or whether there are minerals here. You just take a small little sample, and so this chip that we have also developed can detect dopamine release, mm -hmm. dopamine which is you know deficient in Parkinsonian patients. So you can imagine that the deep brain stimulation electrode has this device which can detect certain levels of dopamine in the mm -hmm. terminal area. And as soon as it detects it, it talks back to the electrode yeah, and shuts shut down. down. Yeah. It's like you have a camera at the back of your car. Right. Even sometimes you can't see. It mm -hmm. will actually apply the brakes and shuts it off. Enough. Enough has happened. Right. But, you know, we're bringing all these technologies developed mm -hmm. piecemeal by piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Now the time has come to really put it together. So right. another way uh, to monitor brain cell activity is to image them. So you, know, you have example of MRI where you get the image very large parts of the brain, but it doesn't provide you very precise location, uh, exact where things might be happening. So this new innovation that has just come out, uh, you know, yesterday and um, a day before is really based on our ability to directly image it on the chip. So normally you would have brain cells that are loaded with the dye, you take it under the microscope, it's an inverted microscope, very fancy, you know, $100,000. Then you have a camera, which is another $40,000, then the software, and then you acquire image that shows you the brain cell when it's active, it's lighting up like Christmas tree. But, you know, having this chip where we can paste uh, these filters directly on the chip, you can image the cell without a, a sophisticated microscope, without a sophisticated camera, without a software and much all hula bala. So, so now we, this is where I'm get, uh, getting a bit confused. So I understand the part of the MRI where li a li we are alive, the live patient, the patient, the head go into the, the, the tunnel and, and get active imaging. Yes. So what are the other alternatives and this, like, do you, uh, like the brain cell being taken out of the brain to, to image this or what's like, that's where I'm getting confused. So right now, you know, we have done is a proof of principle experiment that actually you could image brain cells that are in direct contact with a, with a chip. So you can imagine chip being, you know, um, right now what we have is this chip is, for example, um, mounted onto a platform, mm -hmm. but we could have it in such a way that it is easily flexible, you can move it anywhere around if you were to image the intact brain or the human brain. Oh, I get it. So let me try it this way. So in a sense, you could be attached to a microsurgical instrument and then at the tip of it or something and then get that and then put it inside the brain and then image. Is that? Exactly. Oh, so that's what wow. it is. So you could have, you know, a very sophisticated probe mm -hmm. that has a whole series of filters attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then when you go deep in or different areas, these all filters will be able to image brain very precisely as mm -hmm. to where. And you can also take it as a flat mm -hmm. because it's easily mountable. You don't need a microscope because the trouble with magnet is that you cannot take any um, any tools mm -hmm. when you are doing. So you take the image, you move the magnet out, the surgeon goes, he looks at all the images, and then designs the surgery. But our team here, um, Garnet Sutherland, uh, who was a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. he had performed the intraoperative surgeries where he has a titanium robot that can go inside the, in the intraoperative MRI, and then he could see live images 
when he's performing surgery. Mm. Okay, but in our case, what we think is because it's so portable, you know, one millimeter square of, or, or, you know, it could be an inch, you could take it anywhere. You don't need any sophisticated microscopes or camera or anything. The, as soon as you could touch the brain cells, you could image it. Oh. And the material is very flexible, it's very cheap, it's biocompatible. All these things had to be worked out first. So you can actually do it without the neural arm, right? even though like we do have the neural arm in our backyard, like in the same institute. Yes. You don't actually need the neural arm. You can yes. actually do it without because it's so small, you can actually get the imaging right yes. there. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, before I forget, because this, is, this, this that was one of my questions, is there any additional advantage of combining neurochip like that your technology with NeuroArm or not really? So, you know, the ultimate uh, for us now next step is that we will take this imaging chip, we will merge it with our recording chip. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when these two techniques are there, so for every transistor and a a capacitor, there will be a little sensor, so a little camera that will image brain cells as well. So we will get all modalities working just in case one fails, but we still have access to make the system fails proof. So mm -hmm. when you are to take it to the next stage, which is the implantation in the brain, for people, for example, who lose their arms or legs, your brain cells are intact, but there is no organ. So what you could do is you could implant this device in the sensory motor cortex mm -hmm. without having to go deep into the brain. And then when those cells are firing, the chip picks up the activity of those cells and then it can control the prosthetic device as if it is part of your own body. So actually the $6 million man, like controlling the bionic arm are not too far, far away. Absolutely. Wow. That's where I think the whole technology is heading. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, um, it's, uh, you know, trying to convince granting agencies and people that, you know, come on, I mean, don't be afraid of it or take it in the, I mean, you're a computer scientist, you know that how it would change the gaming industry, mm -hmm. you know, computer games, yeah. where you actually could control all these gadgets without having to really, you know, use your hands and or the haptics. Um, but at the same time, I think, because the natural replacement, as I pointed out, doesn't occur. Brain is damaged, is damaged. There's nothing you could do. There's no treatment. There's no cure. There's no drugs. There's nothing you could do. The only way I, we think is to really develop these or invoke these bionic hybrids and invest in those technologies because it could manage, you know, from simple things to uh, epilepsy to, you know, more severe neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, um, right now the the chip uses uh, snail brain cell and whatnot. And I uh, understand the next step is human brain cell. Would that step? How big is that step uh, or, or jump? Is so that, I, I are think they close that, enough that it's not much of well, a good Well, the brain cells, you know, in snail and rats, and they are all the same because you know snails uh, don't have complex behavior. So, mm -hmm. what Mother Nature designed these animals? They were not designed to really drive a car, talk on the cell mm -hmm. phone, drink their coffee, shave, and do all the stuff at the same time. So they do simple things. As a result, Mother Nature made the best engineering design. To come to think about a pipe, you have a big, large pipe that it has few holes. Mm -hmm. You put water through, most of this water goes through. Some leak mm -hmm. occurs, but it's not really substantial. Mm -hmm. But now you think about having the same number of holes per surface area, and you shrink the size of this pipe to really tiny. This will turn into a sprinkler, right? Mm -hmm. So Mother Nature made the first axon, the electrical signal conducting, was in the squid giant axon. It's a large axon. It conducts beautifully, and Mother Nature was very happy. But then Mother Nature said, I got to make more sophisticated animal. I can't take this big design, big pipe, and put it into a small brain like a rat or a human. So what do I do? Mother Nature shrunk the size of the pipe, but then it put the tape all around it, which is the myelin sheath, to prevent the, 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 uh, the seepage or you know, the leakage of um, fluid you know, or current. So then when Mother Nature shrunk the size, you get the myelin sheath. Now this myelin sheath is wrapped around yours or my nerves. 
it prevents the leakage of current, so the current can go tra travel faster. Mm -hmm. So in you know, Mother Nature, it's designed originally the snails and fruit flies and worms. They work the best because they were simple designed. And then what Mother Nature did when it had to shrink the sizes to be able to fit it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the complications occurred. Now you have too many brain cells and it's very difficult to figure out who is connected to who and how they work. But the fundamental principles of conduction are same. So a neuron is like a brick. You can put it in your house, or you can put it into a you know, um, CN tower, or you can make any other large building with it. It's still the brick is a brick, no matter where it goes. So the brain cell is actually a brain cell, no matter where you fit. Um, but when you go, our next step from snails is, in snails there are 30,000 cells, we know 25,000 of them by name. We can pick the exact cell every time we want, something you cannot do it in rats or any other animal. We know exactly cell A talks to cell B and B talks to cell C and they will always talk. And also because Mother Nature has given them fewer cells, Mother Nature was fair and says, look, if you get damaged, I'll let you regenerate. Grow back the way you did during development. Right all over again, you reconnect. So Mother Nature said, there you go. So they have this capacity when we pluck them out of brain, they regenerate. They reconnect, they regrow as if they are just being born now so so before you go on so meaning that uh when they regrow so the chip will last longer or the the the, the neuron that that was there will, will just stay longer right it's, yeah, it's it, not like it's going to well, die off in like two no, hours it will so. grow it hugs and kiss the chip and then it talks to the chip the chip talks to it so all of them is making really nice buddy buddy and friends and they become part of each other they don't they're not you know ignoring each other or not repulsed by each other that's what we call biocompatibility. Any device you design must be biologically compatible, otherwise you can't transplant it, or you can't put it in the so brain. So different cells uh, or from different uh, snail would communicate, yeah. and then uh, when they, I don't know, like uh, they are, are they soak in solution? So they, when they dry up or when they die, they just regenerate? Is that? No, no, they continue. They continue to live, they continue to grow. We have provided them same solution that would be in the brain. Oh. So you have a cerebral spinal fluid, all the environment is same. Mm -hmm. So instead of sitting in the brain, they are sitting in the test in a, in a little in a culture dish or on the chip. And they are doing what they were doing in the brain, connecting, oh, okay. talking, conduct impulses, mm -hmm. chemical synapses are established. We could detect those, we could do all the kind of stuff. But, but because they are quite large, so um, I mean there are sometimes you know, 40, 50 percent larger than a rat cell, they generate large current. So if you want to design a device mm -hmm. which is really good in terms of uh, generating currents that you could pick up, you go to those those. Oh, I see. Models. Which is why snail was the first one. Like, yeah. And now? Now the rats. The mm -hmm. rat cells are smaller, so we had to shrink the size of our electrodes and make them more sensitive. Mm -hmm. Just enhance the sensitivity. Now we're doing the rats. The next step will be monkeys and then the humans down the line. How long do you see this process takes? Well, I think, you know, it really is, again, on the, depends on the funding because, you know, you need a lot of expertise. This is the field that brings in the best of, you know, many fields together. So you can have biologists, you could have neuroscientists, you have engineers, you have computer engineers, you also have, you know, electrical engineers, chip design, fabrication, bonding facilities, which is, you know, you have to have class 100 to 1,000 clean rooms, where you could prepare your chips. So it's actually very expensive. Mm. So it's not just uh, the, uh, the process of physically separating the, the, the cell individually and undamaged. It's yeah, actually no. a lot of the other stuff. Yes. Like a clean room environment, yeah, cleaner yeah. room. Yeah, so you can have dust. And also I think that all require resources and funding, which mm -hmm. you know is not fulfilled by a simple individual grant, which is hundred thousand a year, mm -hmm. you know, hundred fifty thousand, you can't even hire a technician with that amount. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where unfortunately I think Canada, we were the first team in the world to take the lead. But you know, the others have much more money and then they're willing to take risks. Uh, um, and so uh, you always run the risk of getting scooped because mm. there is no funding. And right. And this is separate and different from the imaging that you were talking about earlier, right? The, the, yeah. 
yeah, but the it's all, and uh, yeah, it's all part of the same paradigm because once you have learned and acquired the ability to interrogate brain cells, mm -hmm. you could use them in a different configuration, right? Mm -hmm. So your cell phone, you could have it, you could put in a calculator in there, you could also have, you know, email, you can have texting, you could have other application put on, even though it's a phone, right? Mm -hmm. So you could use the basic framework, the board, in which you could add the entire lab, bring it on to, this is what we call lab, lab on chip on chip. Mm -hmm. So you bring in the all different modalities, put them together, and make it more work like a brain itself. Mm. Uh, for those who have never heard of uh, lab on a chip, I actually had to look it up. Um, can you briefly explain uh, what it is and then also specifically, more specifically, what is so, it in this context? So I think, you know, normally uh, you, when you can take different modalities, different techniques, different procedures, you put them into one configuration. So one, you know, thing does all, all the tricks. Um, that's what they call it lab on the chip. You can take different lab experimentation tool technologies and you blend them into one. And so it has same power supplies, it has same, you know, major switches, but it can now do multiple things. And can you I, give an example other than the one that we're talking about? The, the so for that? our, you know, for a concept will be, for example, a chip that could detect your, you know, implanted here, can detect your glucose, can detect your blood pressure, can detect your, you know, also do your sampling of the blood to see if you have any cancer factors. So, you know, one device that instead of sending the technology to a laboratory to get mm -hmm. your blood sample for glucose, for sugar, you know, for mm -hmm. cholesterol, all those, it can all be done on on site, right. on one site. And in this specific example of like the neurochip, what, yeah. what, how, how would you explain it? Yes. So in, in our case will be to be able to image the brain cell, to be able to detect the transmitter release, to be able to stimulate them, to be able to record them. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. So um, uh, our chat so far has covered a lot of uh, the questions I have. But uh, let me ask you, have uh, drug companies like uh, Pfizer, GSK, Merck, have they contacted uh, you or your lab uh, in to try to uh, use the technology for, for their testing, drug I testing purpose? Some, we have had some discussions, but I think, you know, where um, we have only demonstrated proof of principle. Again, you need really funding to be able to go to the next stage where you design a prototype, a, you know, prototype that could do multiplexing. So you could have, you know, multiple drugs that could be screened through. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. um, help me a little so with drugs uh, what what happened to the drugs and the chip Let, let's say uh, when it is when it has the thing that you talk, talk about it can do multiplexing what not what like the drug solution are being fed to the neuron like I'm, yeah that part that's, I'm not getting that's what the idea you can think about you know the roots or you know you have a tournament turnip or an onion underground Mm -hmm. um, so that you think about a brain cell that's been sitting there, what you do is you run an irrigation system underneath. So what we do is what we call microfluidics. Oh, microfluidics is the little channels mm -hmm. that are really running underneath each and every sensor. So this fluid that you perfuse from one side comes up, it touch, goes over the brain cell and is sucked out. So you actually have a, just a little irrigation system where each and every oh. brain cell is exposed to a particular drug or mm -hmm. and then you wash away the drug and you look at the effects uh, oh. and so you know uh, what we call microfluidics this is all built underneath the chip mm -hmm. that's why we also it adds on to what we call the lab on chip because the chip is not only monitoring and recording but it's also interrogating and manipulating the system mm. through the microfluidics that is built underneath the chip. Right. So in this current version of the neurochip, you can only do one drug. Is that right? Uh, well, we can do up to four. Up to we four. Mm -hmm. Four to eight channels. The new mm. chip that we're actually developing now mm. uh, is as has you know uh, eight channels on each side, and that would allow us to be able to really four, four on each side. Yes. Mm -hmm. So four on each side, so you could perfuse four cells at any given time, in out, in out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And the what you what you were talking about is with more funding, then you can make yes. it more channel, which is what the drug company yeah. want yeah. when they you do. do up to, yeah, you can do up to hundred channels mm -hmm. because you know all of this requires again, I know funding, which. Uh, 
you know, it's a, a killer. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Look, so in terms of technology commercialization, or at least protecting the intellectual property, I understand. Like uh, in two thousand and six, uh, three patents were filed. Have, have you guys filed uh, more new patents with the new advanced yeah, technology? Yeah, I think more have been filed. We are working on some others, mm. uh, but you know, it's always is a kind of a distraction. You know, you have to, it's one person doing this, then if that person is doing something else, the actual work is not being, you know, so you, in a relay race, you take one body out, you know, the right. whole thing really collapses. So I think, um, uh, you know, uh, again, the rate limiting factor is really the funding. Once mm -hmm. you have funding, you have a branch, a group of people who are filing the patent protecting the IP. The other are really looking at the markets, you know, different drug companies who may be interested in and then the third party is really looking for other applications uh, in the area. Mm, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, that requires a concerted effort on part of an, an academic, uh, you know, institute. Um, and the researchers, you know, we are also not very good at doing that kind of stuff. We are tunnel diggers. We dig tunnels. and. Um, we don't care about you know protecting commercializing. Right. Yeah, you don't want to write claims after, all day. <laughs> and then, or you don't have the money to have, pay someone who would charge you twenty five thousand dollars per patent. You know, mm, right. so I think you know it's a vicious circle, um, and unfortunately, we Canadians are not very good at that. Mm -hmm. So, Navid, um, on that note, how big is the research team? I know, like, the, the you and there's another researcher. I f sorry, I forgot her name. But yes, how big perfect. is the team? So, you, you know, about uh, that? Yeah. she has the 10, 11, 12 people. We have 14, 15 people. Um, you know, my number of PhD graduate students, postdocs, research trainings, and, and technicians. And then we collaborate with NRC. They have two groups in Ottawa. They are also quite a larger team, you know, but unfortunately, NRC is also pulling the money out mm. um, of those. Okay. There is one of the best facilities in North America is in Ottawa. It's mm. through the network, you know, National Research Council uh, of Canada, um, but you know they are pulling the funding, so that also initiative is probably going to die. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I was going to say, hey, this this one thing that University of Calgary, it's really doing cutting edge stuff, but then like <laughs> fund, funding cut, yeah. no good. Yeah, so you know it's all across. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, I think uh, you know. Decisions, political decisions, are made by politicians who are running on a three to four year election cycles. Mm -hmm. They don't really see the future. But you know, if in Canada we don't become knowledge based economy, we'll be dead. We'll be be finished. Yeah, we have to work hard. And on that note, I mean, what are some of the competitors around the world? Is Caltech one of the in the university? Who are the other competitors uh, that are doing? Uh, trying to do something like that. I think that there are lots of them, you know, German teams there are. But the thing is that once you actually show people that it can be done, which mm. we have already done, you know, the cat is out of the bag. Mm. And, you know, and uh, some are more visionary, have more flexibility in terms of funding. I mean, as Caltech, as MIT, then you have, you know, um, um, a number of other universities, Stanford, Harvard, and and then you have Georgia Tech, you know, a number of these schools in the United States, I mean, they are working at different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, not very many teams in Canada. Um, Chunqing in China, I mean, I was there a couple of years, or most recently as well. They offered me a white horse. So the president actually said, I will buy you a white horse if you come and work with us oh. and make it all happen. Mm. So, you know, um, but uh, I feel very um, committed to Canada. This country has been so good. In some way, we can, you know, give something back just as an immigrant, just to say thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it will be a great gesture on our part. But, you know, um, it's, uh, it's the lack of really uh, courage on part of granting agencies a government to have the guts, mm -hmm. you know, um, we don't end up winning that many medals that we should have, we could, and we don't end, end Olympics. And also, we can't really make, make, make major breakthrough. We always think that let the others do it and we will use the technology. And what we don't realize is that we lose all the ca capital and we end up buying the stuff from someone else. 
or triple the prices. Yeah, and and it's even more sad. I mean, to me, as a Canadian, as a UFC alum, uh, the fact that we are cutting edge right now, <laughs> and, oh, and the technology, one like you said, once it's out of the bag, other yeah. people, yes. that's become their starting point, and Absolutely. and it'll be kind of sad when yes. we few years down the road, someone is doing the cutting edge, yeah. and then we are following. And yeah, yeah but you know, we uh, have the lead uh, now. Yeah, I think, you know, um, University of Calgary still has a tremendous vision of biomedical engineering, which is really finding engineering solutions for health problems. Mm -hmm. And that is really what the future is. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot do everything on your own. You have to put best teams of scientists, you know, engineers together to be able to solve a biological problems or health mm -hmm. problem. And I think that's really, university has declared biomedical engineering as a top priority. So it's supporting that venture, but again, it really needs substantive financial support to make it happen. Are there rooms to work with the drugs company or the, even, well, again, I don't know what else, but maybe even the finance, the health, <laughs> the health uh, industry in, in, in yeah, general? Yeah, I think, that, um, I think we, uh, you know, we, we last year we supported, uh, we and set up four centers in partnership with industry. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, the industry is cutting down its R&D. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at post-secondary institutions to, to work with them. So it's a great opportunity yeah. to attract industry, but the academic mindset is very, very different. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, uh, you know, uh, quote that uh, we academics, the only thing we're willing to share is a parking lot and a library and a washroom. That's just about <laughs> it. <laughs> So we're not really programmed to think from that perspective, and um, so I think uh, you know we will give it another try for a year or two, and then either to quit it or you know. Oh, that that that, that, that would be very sad. Yeah, I mean, we definitely don't want to lose a lost expert like yourself, or um, even more like new potential uh, up and comers uh, yes. into. Well, uh, I hate to put it this way, but our competing countries and uh, yeah and and that would be set a set loss for Canada yeah yeah, yeah. I think you know again uh, it really needs the courage mm -hmm. I mean uh, it needs that you know final we're willing to take the risk on this and you know the applic if nothing else I mean one lady who was interviewed after our last discovery she's on the CBC television if you go and type my name you see CBC and she said you know the only thing I've got is a hope if, if you take that hope away from me, I have nothing to hang on to because none of the treatments work for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and, it, yeah, that aspect is, is, is just as important. And mm -hmm. the other important thing is that, you know, for future industry to come, they look for a workforce that is trained in in an in interdisciplinary area. So, you know, if a company wants to come and set up a shop here in Alberta, they would like to, to go for a workforce that can do multiple things. Mm -hmm. Those days of having one trick ponies are gone. Those engineers, you know, you just specialize in one area, one discipline, it's gone. You're not going to find a job. So if you really want to attract, you have to have a program and such as biomedical engineering to be able to attract trained people and these trainees then attract the industry because they know the workforce is here. There is no provincial tax in Alberta. Let's set up a shop. And I think once that that partnership with industry begins to develop, you can then foster a lot more innovation and, and make the pipe from bench to bed and then beyond to market bigger and faster at a much faster rate. And I think, you know, these are the types of things that, uh, you know, senior administration and also the provincial government and the federal government have to really think through very carefully that, you know, we need to make sure that we have healthier, you know, Canadians or Albertans through our technologies that we developed. We need to make sure we're prosperous because those technologies in the market, they make money for us. We need to make sure that our country people are the highest, highly qualified and most educated. And that will come from this interdisciplinary training in different areas. So I think, you know, all these things need to be nurtured at all level to really pull it, pull it off. Yeah, uh, on a personal level, I have a, f a good friend who has uh, Parkinson's disease uh, in the last few years, and and I yeah, the the technology that you're talking about 
could really help him uh, in, in some way. And it's just that, yeah, those technology need to come out like quick. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Right. So um, going back to the, the, the neurochip, in the press release, it talks about in the laboratory settings, uh, stimulate a neurological disorder in individual brain cells and use the neurochip to monitor its response to specific drugs. By stimulate, do uh, you mean like actually physically or, we, or as we were talking about, uh, flood the, the channel with um, chemicals or electrical Stimulant. What, what do you mean by? What does it mean so, by stimulant? But it, what it really means is that you could excite a brain cell either by a chemical. Mm -hmm. So if you added a little bit of potassium, they will all fire, and then so you could you know pick up the activity. Uh, but the idea here is to f do a drug screening because the brain cells are very similar in rats and humans. You know the rats are a lot more easier. So if I cut a slice of rat brain, mm -hmm. I can apply a drug and make it epileptic. Mm -hmm. It will show seizure-like activity. Oh, I see. So I could actually mimic all mm -hmm. of these disease paradigm mm -hmm. in a slice, mm -hmm. animal taken out, right. and I keep kept alive. And then what I could do is do the mid-throughput drug screening, mm -hmm. find a bunch of drugs that will block seizures, and then your prediction would be the same would also be true for humans. I see. And I pointed out when a surgeon takes out the epileptic tissue, we could test the same now with more confidence and then do the drug screening. So I think that's what it really implies is that you could image brain cells as well as record brain cell activity mm -hmm. uh, much more faster. So recording will require that you have the slice in contact, but with this imaging, you know, it's a lot more faster, a lot more quicker. Mm -hmm. Right. And just so that I'm on solid ground, the, the, wet, the wet cells, they all have their own individual life, like especially the red cell or the human cell brain cell. They, they only last for so many hours, is that right? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. Well, the slice, because it's much more intact, it can mm -hmm. last for weeks, oh, and we sometimes even up to months. Mm -hmm. But you can also test the long-term side effects of a drug in, in, in that environment. Oh, okay. Or even in culture, they can last for weeks. Oh, okay, so it's not like two hours, one hour, no. minutes. No. So it's actually in right solution. When yes. you cut it out right, then it can actually... Yeah, plant. for rats, yes. Mm -hmm. but I don't think much has been done for humans yet. Mm -hmm. So those techniques still have to be developed to keep those cells alive for quite, quite a while. Right. The higher you climb in the evolutionary ladder, mm -hmm more sophisticated, you know, the brain cells become, the more pickier. Mm -hmm. Right. For human, is it because it's so much more difficult to manipulate, to get the connection right? Uh, it's not the ethical issue, right? Well, the it's ethical the issue is, I mean, you cannot get access to human tissue unless it's transacted, right? Unless it's been cut out. Right, right, yeah, unless it's a patient's... Yeah. And the patient pre-approved the patient pre -approved that and... And, and yes. That, right. But but the main the key is the the key uh, roadblock is actually the technical side, right? Not, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Right. So yeah, um, it's it's really fascinating. Uh, uh, Navid, uh, years ago I remember when I did my computer science uh, uh, in the uh, I graduated in ninety one uh, in the late eighties uh, when we were talking about computer organization chips, web chip. It was like science fiction. The the prof talk about it like two sentences and now we are like it's it's real and, and it's, yeah it's uh, happening it's here and I think uh, you know um, uh, soon you will begin to see major breakthrough where we begin to really interrogate brain through these uh, computer you know chips and electronic chips the devices so the machines are coming Right. So uh, I guess uh, for people who are watching are Canadians, uh, who should we talk to? Like, who, what, what, uh, who, who is the minister in federal and uh, uh, provincial that, that is responsible for those areas funding? Maybe, maybe some of us should give them a call. Well, I think it's the, again, the, you know, the health minister, industry minister, because, you know, uh, in fairness, our federal government has been very generous in putting money into post-secondary institutes. We're next to Sweden and Switzerland in terms of government funding post-secondary okay. institutes. But we have Do you not mean in the top, like uh, the, yes, the top three? Top, yeah, oh, top, okay. you know, and oh. even better than the United States in oh, some okay. cases. Mm -hmm. But we haven't really been able to attract industry, which Switzerland and Denmark, Norway, you know, and Sweden, they have done. 
is that you know their partners they don't have Stanford, Harvard, or Oxford and Cambridge universities, but they have very strong ties with industry, and as a result, they lead the innovation and you know from uh, up the yin yang. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the government would need to really foster this, but then the industry need to be coaxed that look, you know, if you put in a dollar, we'll put in two dollars, mm -hmm. and then if you are, and this is what we would like you to explore. Mm -hmm. This is the area is that the developing these innovation, innovative technologies for brain, mental health, manipulation. Um, and then I think, you know, the industry minister will be interested in that. And you have health minister and then, you know, post-secondary education senior, you know, ministers. So mm -hmm. I think it starts right at the prime minister level to, mm -hmm. um, you know, prioritize and do targeted funding. Because by the time you write a grant, you go through rigmarole, you know, that technology is no longer an innovation, somebody else, if it's in the public domain, you know, you know, I remember I was in China and uh, just a few months ago and I could see from my room clearly to the other side, but when I woke up, there were two floors built, <laughs> 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 you know, blocking all my view, so it's, uh, what it's a, amazing that how others can, uh, others can really bring in the, the power and the workforce mm. to, uh, to really scoop you. Right. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, the government have to make sure that, you know, they do targeted funding mm -hmm. and say that, you know, if we really mean innovation uh, is that we will take a risk here. Mm -hmm. These people have already demonstrated consecutively for their last, you know, six years or so, mm -hmm. we have brought in technology after technology after technology innovation and, you know, without a single penny. Mm -hmm. I, I cancel all my travel and I don't travel that much and money we could say we put on this project because it's not funded by any granting agents. Mm. The, um, and the companies, are we talking about the, the drugs company in Canada and any, actually anywhere in the world? Or like any, what, I think anywhere that the companies that are do, building biosensors, mm. you know, sensitive, sensitive devices, the companies that are building biocompatible materials, mm. you know, membranes and then oh, okay. companies that are making biofilms, right. you know, the bio... So, so it yeah. doesn't have to be just uh, the drugs company like Pfizer or America. It could be GE, it could be actually 3M or, or whatever company that does. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think all of them really need to come together to solve those problems. It's really, at the end of the day, it's glory enough for all. It's really make it a win-win situation for me to see a kid who couldn't walk. It can walk now, you know, because of the technology you developed or, you know, and live a normal life after seizures is I think it's worth all the investment. Right. So yeah, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to talk to you today, uh, Dr. Navid Sayid. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, Anigit. Thank, Thank you for your interest.